Hello again and welcome back to another installment of our uh, eschatology teaching on our Gardena Valley Assembly YouTube channel uh, uh, view list, what we call our, our playlist, and I'm glad that you're joining with us. And so, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rob Lee. I'm the lead pastor for Gardena Valley Assembly. You can find out more about our church at gvag.net. Um, and with that, um, we're just going to continue with our eschatology teaching. I am an instructor of eschatology at our School of Ministry, um, Southern, Cal so Southern California Assembly of God School of Ministry, our, our, where we're training uh, people to become ministers and to go and preach the gospel. And so with that, we're going to pick up um, on our next session, which we have entitled The Millennial Reign of Christ. Now, in the assemblies, we have what we call 16 fundamental truths, or 16 doctrines, core doctrines. And we have these little uh, pamphlets that we've produced over the years for people to read. You've probably seen them. If you've not seen them, you can go to our national website at ag.org and click on um, our position papers or our uh, doctrines, and you can read these for yourself. Now, there are 16 of them, and the last four are eschatological. Uh, number 13 is the Blessed Hope, which is one of our cardinal doctrines, the rapture of the church. And today we're going to be talking about number 14, the Millennial Reign of Christ. This is uh, 14 of the 16 fundamental truths of the Assemblies of God, um, as outlined in uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. So if you have your Bibles, and um, what I'm doing is I'm just opening up, we're having a little Bible study here. Get your Bible, get a cup of coffee. Um, I am using the New King James Version translation. That's what I've used for years. It came out in 1982. That's the year I graduated high school. So if in case you wondered how old I was. And, um, and I believe that <clears throat> it's a good translation for me. It works for me. I like it. And so I use it. And whatever translation you're using, that's fine. Okay, so let's start um, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while." Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark or their foreheads or, or, or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And then verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he who is part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, uh, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign uh, with him a thousand years. Now that second death is referring to the lake of fire. Some people ask, what is the second death? What does that mean? And the first death is your physical death, and the second death is going to be your spiritual death. Some people think, well, that's when you go to hell, Gehenna. But that's not true. Gehenna is a holding place uh, prior to the great white throne judgment, and then you're cast from the great white throne judgment into the lake of fire, which Jesus himself calls the second death. Uh, some people teach, preferably in the Roman Catholic tradition, that um, there is a place in hell called purgatory, where you suffer for a while, and then you get to go to heaven. But that doctrine is not true. Um, here, people go to hell, um, and they wait before they're called up at the great white throne, and then they're cast into the lake of fire, the second death. But what we're talking about here is the millennial reign of Christ. The millennial reign of Christ. Let me read this to you. This is from our uh, Statement of Fundamental Truths here. The second coming of Christ includes the rapture of all Christians, which is our blessed hope, followed by the visible return of Christ with his saints to reign on the earth for a thousand years. Um, this millennial... Uh, reign will bring the salvation of Israel as a nation and the establishment of universal peace. Um, the importance of this doctrine. It sometimes seems that Satan has the world so enslaved in his grasp that conditions have no chance of improving. But God is not dead, as some skeptics claim. This was written probably in the maybe late 50s, early 60s, and the phrase he's referring to is, 
uh, Dietrich Nietzsche's God is Dead, uh, Time Magazine, I think it was in 1969, had a, one of their uh, 52 issues, uh, had that phrase, God is Dead, referring to uh, Nietzsche's statement, God is Dead. And so people believe back then, well, there's no God, he's not with us, all these terrible things that are going on. The truth is, Nietzsche is dead and not God, just for the record. Anyway, uh, God has declared that the world conditions will become increasingly bad before he comes for his own and begins the sequence of end time events. What that tells you in the assemblies is that we are not kingdom now. We don't believe that the whole world is going to get great and then God returns. That's not what we believe. Knowing this, we do not lose hope as sin and crime and, and natural disasters increase year after year. God's word has predicted of what we are seeing, but his word also tells us that in the end, he will be the victor. He is the victor. The millennium will demonstrate that God's reign and government is perfect. It will replace all the failed systems of human government. Biblical prophecy indicates that Israel as a nation has a, a continuing place in God's plan for the end times. We believe that at some future time, the hearts of the Jews will turn in large numbers to the Messiah who died for them and for all mankind. You should know that um, our church, Guardian of Valley Assembly, is a pro-Semitic fellowship. So if you're Jewish and you're watching us, just know we love you. We celebrate the seven feasts of the Lord every year. We recognize the significance and the Jewish contribution to our Bible. We recognize, like Paul recognizes, that the root supports us. In other words, that we got our Bible from the Old Testament, Jews, all of them, and in the New Testament as well, so we recognize but we also recognize that the difference between a Christian and a Jew is Jesus Christ. In other words, if you are a Jew and you accept the Christ, you can still be a Jew. You'll just be what we call a completed Jew or a Messianic Jew. For Christians, we don't consider ourselves completed Jews, although we probably would be from a certain point of view. We just see ourselves as followers of Christ, and that's our, that's our mandate. So with that, let's get into our study on the millennial reign of Jesus. I should like to say that in Bible prophecy, there is more prophetic uh, scriptures that describe the millennial reign of Jesus than any other thing in prophecy, including the rapture of the church. The millennial reign is a very significant doctrine. And for us to believe and know that one day Christ will rule and reign from the throne of his father David, it helps us to better understand the Old Testament prophets. As a matter of fact, uh, we're taking our church through the entire Bible, and right now we're going through uh, the Old Testament prophets. I could not teach that if I didn't have a, a clear understanding of the millennial reign. If you're not familiar with that, you're tuned in to the right channel. I'll do my best to uh, uh, simply and accurately explain it to you. Okay, the first thing that Jesus does when he returns to the earth is to sequester the devil and cast him into the bottomless pit, where he and his demons will be jailed for uh, the millennial reign of Jesus. Um, basically, one angel comes and grabs the devil and throws him into the bottomless pit. Now, people say, what's the bottomless pit? The way uh, Perry Stone describes it is probably the best way. He's thrown into a chamber within the earth. Some people say it's the center of the earth where he turns round and round in this molten lava and he can't get out. And his demons are sequestered, so they can't, they can't do any uh, damage or any kind of deception. It's one angel. I'm remembering back in the 80s when I was a different guy, I had more hair, and uh, I listened to a lot of Christian uh, rock music in those days, and I remember the band Striper in one of their albums called The Hell with the Devil, To Hell with the Devil, was, uh, it showed like four or five angels throwing the devil into the, into the uh, bottomless pit, and I thought to myself, you know, if they would have just read this passage, they their artists could have maybe drawn that correctly. The idea of one angel throwing the devil into the pit tells you that he's not as strong as he makes himself out to be. And that's probably the greater truth there. Okay, let's move on. The beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire at the beginning of the millennium. Up until this point, right now, currently, the lake of fire is empty. There's nobody there. Everybody's being cast into Gehenna. That's a judgment that's going to come after the great white throne judgment. However, the beast, that's the physical man who will be this world leader, 
Some people it's, uh, say it's this guy, Macron, in, in, uh, in Europe. Some people say it's Obama. Some people think it's their mother-in-law. We don't know who the Antichrist is. We only know that, that the, the devil has always had a henchman in the waiting because he doesn't know when the Christ is returning. So a lot of people can, can fit that bill. Um, and then we have um, uh, this other person who is a false prophet. A lot of people believe he'll be a kind of a religious leader, like a pope or an iman. Um, a lot of people are saying it's the current pope, whether you believe that or not. Again, does it really matter? We're not looking for the Antichrist, and we're not looking for the false prophet. We're looking for Jesus Christ. That's our target, so hopefully that'll help you. Okay, there will be a new temple built in Jerusalem in the near future. This is what we call the third temple. Okay, the glory of the Lord will fill that temple when Jesus returns to the earth with his church to set up his millennial kingdom. Now, the third temple, what we call the tribulation temple, will be built. But Ezekiel's temple, which is the fourth temple, that will be the millennial temple. They may be the same temple, just with a major room addition, or we may have a complete uh, destruction of one temple and rebuilding of another. We're not sure because the temple hasn't been built yet. Um, if they build it on the foundation that a lot of people believe the Western Wall is the Roman garrison that was in, in Jerusalem in Jesus' day, that'll be the wrong foundation. If they build it on what a lot of people believe is the correct foundation, which is located in the city of David about 400 yards east of the Wailing Wall, um, that will be the right foundation. So whichever foundation they choose, when Jesus Christ comes back and builds it, trust me, he will build it on the right foundation. Nobody, no more debates need to, be, uh, need to be dealt with there. And yes, his glory will fill that temple, and that's the temple I'm referring to. Now, during this time, there will be uh, sacrifices offered for worship in that temple uh, to commemorate what Christ did for us. A lot of people have a hard time understanding that sacrifices will uh, ensue uh, during the, uh, in the tribulation temple. And, and it will also take place in the millennial temple as well. And this is not to uh, provide a way of salvation according to the Old Testament law, but more to commemorate what it was that Christ did. And that's the greater truth. I'll give you an example. We take Holy Communion regularly. We take Holy Communion. So when we, we eat the bread and we, we drink the cup, we're not actually eating the actual body and drinking the actual blood of Jesus, although Roman Catholics believe that. That's what we call the doctrine of transubstantiation, which, by the way, is a doctrine of a demon. That's not true, because if it were true, then we would be re-crucifying the Christ every time we took Holy Communion. And the Bible is replete and says that Christ died once for all. So he doesn't have to do it again. So when we take the bread and, and drink the juice, um, that's symbolic. It's to commemorate. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. So similar to that will be what's taking place in the Millennial Temple with these sacrifices. Now there will be priests who will serve in the Temple and the Jews will live uh, in the whole land that God promised to Abraham. Each of the 12 tribes of Israel will have their share of that land. Now right now the land is all divided. You've got Palestinians living and Jewish people and it's they're kind of on top of each other and there's a lot of uh, unrest at times. It, it gets a little tense but during this millennial reign, it'll all be laid out for the tribes of Judah. And that's exactly what's, what's going to happen. Now, if you're watching this and you are an anti-Semite or an anti-Semitic, which that is you don't like the Jewish people, you are not going to like the doctrine or the idea of what we call Zionism. And Zionism, in a nutshell, is, is a global Jewish rule. And folks, I hate to say it, but or I should say I'd like to say it. Hey, if you don't agree with that, I want to tell you that Zionism is real. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews, will rule and reign from the throne of his father David, which means that David not so much was his, his uh, earthly father. He was just in the line of David. Christ came from the line of David. David was a king, and then Christ will also rule from that same place that David ruled from the Old Testament. That's what that means. And so you need to know that Zionism is true and, in, in fact, will happen. Okay. Now, the Muslims uh, who currently live in Israel, were, are, they're going to be gone. Some people say, well, what happens to the Muslims? And the theory is that during the tribulation, although the Muslims will be uh, very prevalent, um, and they will, they will, uh, their system of belief will, 
will be prevalent and they will amass greatly when Christ returns in the battle of Armageddon. It's believed that at that time he will wipe out um, any and all belief systems that are not consistent with true Christianity, true faith, and that will be judged at the judgment of the nation. So that's what we believe when the Muslim system and other systems of the world will be gone. So during the millennial reign, when Jesus will rule on the earth, he'll rule for a thousand years. Uh, a time after the tribulation, but before the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. There's this window of time. Okay, Jesus made uh, the one complete and perfect sacrifice for sin on the cross when he died, once for all, because of our sin. There now is no need for other sacrifices uh, or human priests. However, during the millennial reign, there are sacrifices and priests working and serving in and around the new temple. The temple, the sacrifices, and the priests are all for the Israelites. So during the millennium, people from other nations will worship with them in Jerusalem, and they will experience true Israelite worship. Let's take you to a passage in Zechariah 14.6 that better illustrates this. Just one, just one real quick verse, 14.6. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year and worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. So there's this picture of the entire world, and of course in the Old Testament, the, the uh, men and the young men are required to worship uh, the Lord three times a year. They have to present themselves to the Lord. And so that's the, that's the, uh, the picture there that we want to commemorate there. Uh, let me read on verse 17 and following. Um, and it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up to enter in, they shall not have any rain. They shall receive the plague which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacle. In that day, holiness to the Lord will be engraved on the bells of the horses, the, the pots uh, in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them to cook in them. Uh, in that day there shall be no longer a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So there's this picture of a reinstitution of the Old Testament sacrifices. Again, not for the purpose of salvation, but to commemorate. So that's the true Israelite worship. Now, in the Old Testament, the sacrifices refer forward to the Messiah, but during the millennial reign, the sacrifices we refer back, again, to commemorate the death of Messiah. I should say death and resurrection. The sacrifices could never alone um, atone for the sins of the Old Testament's uh, people. Only Jesus could do that, and he did. So in the Old Testament, when a person who followed God's law uh, made the sacrifices and followed God's law. When they died, their soul went into a place called Abraham's bosom, which is a place of comfort and holding that was across this great gulf fixed in the lower parts of the earth, across from, from Gehenna, hellfire and damnation. And when Christ resurrected, he went down to the lower parts of the earth and there he ministered to the people in Abraham's bosom. And when he resurrected, he took them with them into paradise in the kingdom of heaven. Now we believe Abraham's bosom is completely empty. And all the people in uh, Gehenna could see over and see that happening and realize that they got to go, but these others must suffer in hell for, for all eternity. Uh, during the millennial reign, temple sacrifices will not atone for sins, but they will remind people about the one and only atoning sacrifice that Jesus the Messiah gave. He gave his life, and this is the only sacrifice that can atone for sin. In a similar way, Christians observe communion, the bread and the wine represent the body and blood of Christ. This act refers back to the death of Christ, Christ on the cross, where Jesus instructed in the New Testament to do this in remembrance of me. Now, the animals in the sacrifices occurring during the millennial reign represent the work of the Messiah, which is completed. It's completely finished. These sacrifices commemorate Christ's work on the cross, similar to how Jesus will retain his scars throughout eternity to remind us of what it took for us to receive our salvation. This is a very powerful picture. As a matter of fact, Christ retains his scars for
for all eternity in his perfect body to remind us of what it took for us to be saved. Somebody said, well, Pastor Rob, what if like a, a million years from now, um, somebody decides to do what the devil did and go against God? And the Lord will say, look what it took. And they'll know, oh yeah, that's right. We won't have any evil thoughts. We don't have anything that we'd want to ever do that again. That's not even allowed in the kingdom of heaven. And so there's that picture of hope that Christ uh, gives us to remind us of what it took for us to be saved. And that's a greater truth. Now, is Ezekiel's temple is a very, very large, large temple. And you know, it has a lot of uh, rooms and a lot of uh, open area. Because the way it works is people come to worship, a, a group of people will walk across one way, then a group of people walk across another way, and, they, and back and forth and so forth as a part of their ceremonial um, worship of the Lord during the millennial reign. And so we see that Jesus will reign from the throne of his father David in Jerusalem. The removal of the curse will be implemented, which will have a renewing effect on the environment. We believe it will be a pre-Edenic state where people will live longer, they'll be healthier. Uh, a lot of times people ask me, will people die during the millennial reign? Some people say yes, some people say no. My, my attitude is this. The principle of death, the sin principle, will have been put down. Jack Van Ippe teaches, or I should say used to teach, he's gone home to be with the Lord, that since the sin principle is put down, there is no death. But then you have other other places you read where the scripture says, oh yeah, but this person will live to be a lot longer, as if they were eventually going to die. So the way I respond to that is this, something's going to happen either in the environment or as a result of what the Lord does or as a result of modern medicine and technology where people will be younger, they'll be, their youth will be rejuvenated and they'll live longer and they'll be able to repopulate the planet during this time. It'll be a great time of prosperity and blessing. The blessing of God will be all over the entire planet and people will, will want to serve the Lord and people will follow the Lord. Now granted, he will rule uh, with the throne and he'll rule with a rod of iron, the, the scepter of iron, the idea of it'll be an authoritarian. In other words, it will be a th theocracy where Christ will rule. Um, and so there'll be that idea of governance, global governance under Jesus Christ. We hear a lot about one world government now, but the truth is, is when the one world government will happen, it'll happen during the millennial reign where Christ will be uh, in complete command. The lion will lay down with the lamb and the baby will uh, be able to be with a venomous snake safely with no harm to anyone. Sometimes you might get people that say, I believe we're living in the millennial reign right now. And I always tell them, well, let's test it. Let's put a lamb in a den with a lion and see what happens. And like John Hagee says, you know what happens? Lunch happens for the lion. Or let's put a baby in a, in a pen with a, with a dangerous snake. The, the snake will bite the baby. So the idea is that we're not living in the millennial reign. That's, that's the whole point. When the sin principle is put down, these animals aren't eating each other. We're not seeing that happen anymore. The millennial temple will be built atop of the original foundation uh, of the first uh, two temples. That's why I say if they build the third temple on the wrong foundation, when Christ returns, he'll establish Ezekiel's temple or the fourth temple on the correct foundation. Temple sacrifices will be reinstituted, but not for salvation. It's to commemorate or commemoration. Technology and longevity will accelerate tremendously in this Christ-centered pre-Edenic world era. So people say, do you think Star Trek would ever happen? Uh, spaceships flying other planets, all that stuff, all high technology and everything. It's possible as long as Christ is in command. He may allow for that. We don't know. It's only speculative. But the idea of a, a better future world is what's being promoted here and what's being communicated here. And that's something that we all look for. Now, the millennial reign of Jesus will be a time when angels, glorified saints, and mortals will coexist peacefully. So get this. You and I as Christians in our glorified bodies can translate between earth and heaven. Just with a thought, we can be there. So people in their mortal bodies that are living and being born during the millennial reign will get used to the fact that there's angels. Jesus Christ is right there. A glorified saint is right here. That will become normal for them. That will not be abnormal. That will be like, hey, there's an angel. Hey, there's a glorified saint. Oh, he just went to heaven. We can't do that, but they can. Oh, look, there's Jesus. Hey, Jesus, how you doing? Hello, how you doing? That's what's going to be happening during the millennial reign. So a person born during that time 
All the tribulation, all of the New Testament era, all the Old Testament era will all be history books for them. What they're getting is they're living in a time of euphoria where Christ rules and reigns and his blessing permeates the entire planet. That's what's going to be taking place during that time. Uh, we're going to put a chart up for you so you can see it. Again, this chart comes from Tim LaHaye and Thomas Ice in their book, Charting the End Times. Uh, you can get a copy of that uh, on uh, Amazon or you can go to their website, either one of them, and you can get it. So we have Christ's second coming. We covered that in another session. We have the 75-day interval. Also covered that in another session. And then we have the beginning of the millennial reign, okay? Where Christ is ruling from the throne of his father David. We have the removal of the curse. We have this millennial temple, and temple sacrifices are being um, commemorated. Then after a thousand years, the Bible says that the devil will be loosed from the bottomless pit. And they'll come out, and they'll look around, and they'll see a completely transformed earth. Everything is perfect. Everything is beautiful. And the first thought is, I'm going to destroy this world. And the Lord is going to allow him for a short period of time, the Bible says for a short period of time, to deceive the nations. And people look at that and they say, well, why in the world would the Lord want that to happen? And here's why. Everybody has to be tested. Nobody gets a free ride. So people that are born during the time of the millennial reign are used to Christ being there and angels and our glorified body, the use of worship and, and celebrating. They've not been tested. And so the devil will test them. And many, the Bible says, many will be deceived and follow after him. And that's a tragic thought. Like Christ could be on scene, angels could be on scene, glorified saints, the blessing of God all around, and people will still go after the devil, that sin principle that he brings into the equation, just like he did in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And the Bible says there's going to be a great amassing of an army, that they're going to come up against Jerusalem to destroy Jerusalem. And the Lord is going to destroy all of those people just with a fierce fire. And the Bible says that the devil who deceived them will be cast into the lake of fire with the beast and the false prophet, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. And then the Bible says that all those people that have been sequestered in, in Gehenna are going to be brought up from Gehenna, and they're going to be judged at the great white throne judgment. And then from there, they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. Then hell itself will be cast into the lake of fire. And this uh, new heavens and new earth is going to be cast away. And we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. And then we'll move into this place we call eternity. This concept of eternity. That's really in a nutshell what's going to take place during this time we call the millennial reign of Christ. I realize that it's a lot of information. It's uh, concise and brief. But it's truth. And I think it's important that each of us recognize and ask ourselves the question, what do we believe? And with that, I should like to uh, encourage you to continue studying God's Word. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, to invite Him to come into your life and make Him your Lord and your Savior. He'll regenerate your soul, your spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Get yourself into a good Bible-believing church. Read your Bible, pray, witness, seek the Lord in a greater way. And you'll get to be raptured with the rest of us when that day comes. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.